This Christmas season, we've been looking at the songs of Christmas. December 1, Zechariah's song. December 8, the angel's song. December 15, Mary's song. And then on December 24th, Christmas Eve, the angel's song part two. Today, I'm going to conclude with Simeon's song. All of these songs are found in Luke chapters 1 and 2. Now, you may recall, if you were here on Christmas Eve, with the, when I spoke about the angel song part 2, I said that there were four key words that appear twice in the Christmas story. And those words are, for all the people. The angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem and said, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Now, when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to Jerusalem to be dedicated in the temple 40 days after his birth, they met an older priest by the name of Simeon. Now, God had promised Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. When the old priest saw the baby Jesus, he instantly knew that God's promise to him had been fulfilled, and he said, I have seen the Savior you have given to all the people. There's those words again, to all the people, or for all the people. Did you all get an outline in your bulletin here this morning? Go ahead and underline those four key words. For all the people or to all the people. And then Simeon said, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. So here's the question. If Jesus were born today, would it be any different than 2,000 years ago? Are we any more prepared for the coming of Christ than they were in Bethlehem? Well, we all like to think the answer, of course, is yes, that we would be ready. There would be room at our inn, of course. We'd find room, or we'd make room, or maybe throw somebody out of their room. But in any case, we'd be ready for Jesus if he were born in Bakersfield. Isn't that right? Amen, Amen. yeah. When you read the Bible, it appears that a lot of people weren't prepared for his coming. Herod certainly wasn't. He was the king at the time. He certainly wasn't. Nor were the scribes, even though they knew where he was to be born. Much of Bethlehem didn't seem to have paid any attention to the young couple from Nazareth. The rulers of the world never knew he was born. Just another peasant child born to peasant parents. In Rome, they paid no attention. In Athens and Alexandria, no one took note. In China and India, no one knew a thing. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. He came in the same way All babies come, and most of the world paid no attention. He was in the world, and although the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. You mean his own world, his own people, his own nation didn't receive him? The very people who should have been happiest to see him paid no attention at all, never mind all the world. So we think we're a whole lot more enlightened than those folks were then. But that's not the whole story here, folks. While while it is true that the nation as a whole was not ready for his birth, there were some who were. Within Israel, there were those who believed 
The time was drawing near for God to at last keep his promises and send the Messiah to the earth. Those folks, by and large, didn't get involved in political intrigue or violent actions. Rather, through godliness and prayer, they hoped to be ready when the Messiah at last came on the scene. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. You might want to underline that phrase there, the Holy Spirit was upon him. Likely, I'm thinking, Simeon practiced spiritual disciplines, which invite the Holy Spirit into one's life. If you build it into your daily lifestyle, the Holy Spirit will come. Day by day, Simeon had prayed, reflected on Scripture, and waited for the Lord's Christ to appear. Perhaps every time he went to the temple to do his service as a priest, he saw a baby, or maybe a child, or a man, and he'd ask God, is this the one? How would he know which one was the Christ? And as he grew older, perhaps Simeon's anticipation grew stronger because he knew that he's not going to live forever, and God had promised him. He'd see the Messiah before he died. So, 40 days after his birth, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple for his dedication as their firstborn son, according to the law of Israel. There was nothing outwardly to distinguish them from any other poor young couple coming with their newborn son. Joseph, he was a carpenter from Nazareth. She was a peasant girl carrying a little baby boy. If if you were there, people watching, you ever go to the mall and watch people or go to some place where there's a a crowd or anything, just kind of watch people? You ever do that? Nobody does that. Okay. (laughs) I thought that's why you went to the Kern County Fair, but okay. (laughs) If you were people watching, let's say, you probably wouldn't give Mary and Joseph and the baby a second glance. They just kind of blend in with with the crowd. Yet, here it is, a divinely planned encounter was arranged for that day. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. If, If you're used to the Holy Spirit being with you, because you've been practicing spiritual disciplines day by day, now, I guess, I guess you would take the Holy Spirit's guidance on some particular day. So guided by the Holy Spirit, Simeon came into the, holy, into the temple. Hearing the whisper of God, Simeon realized that his long days of waiting were finally over. This is the one. The Lord's Christ is before him. Perhaps he simply walked over and introduced himself and said, do you mind if I hold your child? Holding the infant Jesus, Simeon may have thought, I'm holding the salvation of the world in my arms. And then he raised his song of praise. His beautiful song has come down through the centuries to us as the final and climactic song of Christmas. It's called in the Latin, Nunc Dimittis. The title taken from the first words of the Latin translation of Simeon's words, now you dismiss. He's addressing God, saying, now you're dismissing me, God. The song is followed by a personal word of prophetic blessing to Mary. Sovereign Lord, Simeon said, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You might underline that word dismiss. 
It's actually a military term used to describe a sentinel who's been standing watch throughout the night. And as the sun comes up, he knows his work is done. He's completed what he's been assigned to do. And he goes to his commanding officer to be dismissed. And once dismissed, he can go back to the barracks and sleep. Maybe Simeon is now ready to pass on. What he has been waiting for has arrived. His faithful waiting is finished, for he has seen and personally held the Lord's Christ. Now, sometimes we hear stories of terminally ill patients who say, Doctor, I, I'd just like to stay alive until Easter. And when Easter comes, they quietly slip away. Or they say, you know, I'd, I'd like to stay alive just long enough to see my granddaughter get married. And they live long enough to see her down the aisle, and then they're gone. Doctors see it happen all the time. Once the goal is reached, life is complete, and death comes quickly. Simeon won't live to see the Lord grow up. He won't witness any of the great miracles. He won't see Jesus walk on the water or feed the 5,000. Simeon will be long gone before Jesus stands in front of Pilate. The crucifixion is hidden to Simeon. So is the resurrection. But it doesn't matter that he won't see the end because Simeon has seen the beginning and that is enough. In his glimpse of Jesus, Simeon tells us three very important things about who Jesus is. Let's look at them very quickly. First thing he tells us, that Jesus is the glory of Israel. In this baby, Simeon sees the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people across the centuries. To call Jesus the glory of Israel takes us all the way back to the time of Abraham when the Lord had said to him, I will make your name great and make of you a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That promise was reaffirmed to Abraham's descendants, to Isaac and Jacob and then to, then to Moses when God spoke to him and rose him, raised him up as a great prophet. And God promised David a son. King David, he was promised a son who would reign on his throne forever. What was that hymn we sang at the beginning of the service? Once in David's royal city. Bethlehem was King David's hometown. Where was Jesus born? In David's royal city. Later, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and promised that a son would be born of a virgin and that his name would be called Emmanuel. God with us. Still later, the prophet Micah predicted that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so for generations, the promises were repeated, father to son, mother to daughter, and Jew Jewish children were taught to pray for the Messiah's appearance. Now some Jews thought the Messiah would be a great political leader who would overthrow the Roman rulers and restore Israel to its rightful place in the world. Others expected a second Moses or a second Elijah. Still others thought the Messiah would be God himself. There was a lot of expectation. And on the lips of every expectant Jew was the question, why does the Messiah delay his coming? You know, it's a question I've pondered too. Jesus promised that he would return one day to fulfill his kingdom. And sometimes I ask, what's taking him so long? So now after all of these years, Simeon realizes that God's promises, beginning with Abraham and all the way through, are coming true. And so that's what Simeon means when he calls Jesus the glory of Israel. 
Here's the second thing that Simeon said about Jesus. He said, he is the savior of the world. Simeon calls him a light of revelation for the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? That's us. That's you and me. Unless you were born Jewish. You won't find this particular phrase in any of the other songs of Christmas. Not in Zechariah's song or Mary's song or the angel's song. Mary's song is completely Jewish. The Gentiles aren't a part of the picture. The same is true of Zechariah. The angel's song broadens the viewpoint a little bit by mentioning peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And the angel's announcement shares these four words also found in Simeon's song, for all the people, remember? But nowhere in any of the previous songs are the Gentiles mentioned by name. Simeon explicitly says that this baby will not only be the glory of his own people, he will also be the light of revelation for the Gentiles, all the other people. He's not just for Israel. He came to shine a light of revelation of God into every nation, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue. Simeon's words explode forever a narrow nationalism. He's the savior of the whole world. Rich and poor, young and old, black and white, Jew and Gentile, American and Japanese, healthy and handicapped, the left, the, the, those in and those left out. He's the savior for everyone. All the people are included in his coming. He came for the whole wide world, like that little song says. Jesus loves the little children. Remember that song? All the children of the world. Anybody remember that? Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. He came for all people. Jesus is the great unifier of all peoples. In him, all can be reconciled to God and brought into God's own family. He is the hope of the world. And that means, that means there is hope for you at Christmas time. If you are lonely this year, you're included in Simeon's song. If your family has turned its back on you, you're included in Simeon's song and meant to be in God's family. If you feel forgotten, depressed, discouraged, down on your luck, be of good cheer. Christmas is for you. Whatever sins are holding you back this year, Christmas means that you can be forgiven because Jesus came for you. God sent his son to the earth to fulfill his promises to Israel and to be a savior for all people everywhere. Third thing Simeon says about Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. It's a personal word of prophetic blessing to Mary. I just said Jesus is the great unifier, and that is true. But here Simeon says to Mary, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. How ironic, or should I say tragic, that Jesus, the great unifier of all humanity, should also be the great divider. Even as the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, they heard Simeon say, he will cause many to rise and to fall. He will not be universally liked, and the hidden thoughts of the heart will be revealed. He will divide people. Are you with him? Or are you against him? Where are you? Wasn't it our Lord himself 
who said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Simeon saw it from the beginning that people rise or fall according to their personal response to Jesus. There was Herod and the wise men. One tried to kill Jesus, and the others worshipped him. There was Peter, who repented, and Jesus, or excuse me, and Judas, who committed suicide. There was Pilate, the Roman governor, who tried to wash his hands of Jesus. And then there was the Roman centurion out there at the cross who said, surely this was the Son of God. There was one thief on the cross that day Jesus was crucified who cursed and ridiculed Jesus. And there was another thief who believed in him. <coughs> From the beginning of his life to the very end, Jesus divided the human race. Who is he to you this morning? You either go higher spiritually when you meet Jesus or you turn around and go the other way. It's either up or down. Which way are you going? Christianity, if false is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Many people try to sit on the fence with Jesus. They call him a good teacher, a good, a good person, a great moral example, and so on and so on. But there really is no neutrality with Jesus. Either he is the Son of God from heaven, or he's not. If he's not, then we have to consider that he's the greatest fraud in human history, guilty of deliberately concealing his true identity and worthy of our deepest scorn. But if he is the Son of God, then the only possible response is to join those three wise men and bow down and worship him. Either you join Herod in trying to kill him, or you join the wise men in bowing down and worshiping him. Remember, if you are indifferent, you've really joined the side that wants to kill him. Did you notice how Simeon put it? Because of Jesus, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Underline those words. Many hearts will be revealed. The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The way you respond to Jesus reveals what's in your heart. Think about that one. But that's not all. The way you respond to Jesus tells where you are going and how you're going to get there. There really is no neutrality with Jesus. He did not really give us that option as he asked Peter, so he asks each one of us, who do you say that I am? We know if we've been coming to church long enough and reading our Bibles, we know that Jesus was born to die for our sins. And I suppose there could have been a cross hanging over that cradle where he lay. And a sword will pierce your own soul too, Simeon said to Mary. Isn't it true? The worst thing for a parent is to see your children suffer. Isn't that true? Most of us will do anything to spare our children needless pain. We'll gladly suffer ourselves if it will make the way easier for our children. That's what it means to be a mom or a dad. You take the pain yourself so your children won't have to. Down the road, Simeon's words to Mary came true. They hated Mary's child. They spread rumors about Mary and Joseph and smeared his name, Jesus' name, with malicious lies. 
They snickered and said, he thinks he's the son of God, but he's just filled with demons. In the end, Mary stood by the cross and watched her son die a brutal, agonizing death. It was like a sword piercing her soul. Above the cradle does stand a cross. When Simeon took the baby Jesus into his arms, he said, Lord, I'm ready to go home now. I can die in peace. Truth is, no one is ready to die until they have seen Jesus Christ with the eyes of faith. Until you have seen him and known him and trusted him as your Savior, you're not ready to die. Because once you have truly seen him, death is no longer an enemy. You may come to the close of your life not having been as successful as you like. You may live in some frustration because you haven't accomplished all your personal goals. But... And this is a very big but. If you can go to the end of your life and say, I have seen the Lord's Christ, then your life is complete. At Christmas time or any time, the only thing that really matters is to know Jesus Christ. Will you say these words from Luke chapter 2 with me? Luke 2, 29. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Amen.